I'm digging out my pollinator garden. Again. I first installed this garden back in 2017, and I did what most of us do, headed to the garden nursery and bought a bunch of butterfly bush. I've since learned that that's really doing a disservice to pollinators. So I'm gonna be replacing everything in this garden with native plants that can both provide food and serve as host plants so our butterflies and pollinators can reproduce here as well. Come on, I'll show you what we're starting with. Hang on, before she does that, I wanna tell you about a challenge I gave myself with this garden design. I wanted to get this pink phlox into our shed garden, but it's really not my favorite color and I don't usually gravitate toward warm colored gardens. So I'm gonna to try to design a warm color palette that I like by taking inspiration from art, but more on that later. So I installed the original garden in the heat of summer five years ago, and most of the plants didn't survive to the second year. I reworked the garden a second time a few years back, but the plants that have survived are mostly tired and neglected. And in the meantime, I've been learning about how deeply connected the relationships are between native insects and plants. So for this pollinator garden redesign, I'm asking myself, what would the pollinators pick if I took them garden shopping? Well, to start, about 25% of our native pollinators are plant specialists. This means they've evolved in a sort of duet with one specific plant, and they require that specific pollen. Their life cycles are synced with these plants so that they emerge from their nests just as their plants are flowering. How cool is that? Most of our butterflies and moths can only reproduce using specific native plants, which we call host plants. The monarch and the milkweed is just one example of this, but I've been surprised at how common this type of relationship actually is. And finally, research shows that birds and pollinators prefer yards with native plantings and that they're better able to thrive and reproduce in yards with native plants. Yards with mostly non-native plants are visited less and lead to lower reproductive success. Let me show you the garden now and then I'll show you how I'm redesigning it. I love a shed garden. I think they're the cutest things. And just for reference on size, this is not a very big space. This little landing pad is about five by five. The shed itself is about 16 feet long. So not a huge space, but I'm going to try to pack it full so that we don't get as many weeds. This is an area that gets full sun and we get just completely saturated with weeds. It's really hard to keep up with. What I have in here now are some inkberry hollies. These are native to my area, so I'm going to keep these. I can't wait to show you these in the summer. They get absolutely smothered in bees. So I really love those and they're nice because they give a lot of structure and kind of bound the garden. Then I put in some lavender. You can see it's not doing very well. It's been neglected for a little while. I think it's better to probably cut this back every year if you're going to do lavender. I'm going to go ahead and pull these out. They're not looking very good and again they're not serving as a as a host plant. So I'm going to trade these out for some um, North American natives. Here we have a butterfly bush. Pretty much everybody who installs a pollinator garden ends up putting in a butterfly bush, so this is going to go as well. Again, it's just not serving the purpose that I want for this garden. Is that a cottonwood? I brought a bucket of water so that if I dig up anything that I want to rehome, I can get it in the water so it doesn't sit out in the open. And in here, everything that I've tried has died. So I'm going with some full sun lovers that can tolerate drought. The nice thing about our native plants is they get really deep roots. So they'll survive fine. They won't even know that there's a drought going on. Here is a mulberry of some kind. They tend to hybridize, so it's hard to tell the Asian varieties from the North American varieties. I've got these everywhere, so I'm gonna dig that out. And then this is a bluebeard. It's not registered as an invasive, but it has been taking over this area. It does attract a lot of pollinators, but so will the plants I'm gonna replace it with. So I'm really not stressing um, getting rid of these at all. Another inkberry, more lavender around the front. And then I tried to repeat it on the other side. I tried to keep it symmetric. So more inkberry, more bluebeard. You can see the bluebeard is coming out into the front here. It's made some babies all along the side there. This side is a little bit more of a shade garden. So I'm going to do this side um, separately. Another butterfly bush that's taking over. We've been having kids the last few years, so I haven't been keeping up. Here is a nice invasive bittersweet that's gonna go for sure. It's everywhere, smothering the state of Maryland. This is a beautiful plant. It's called goat's beard. It's really big and fluffy. I love this one. Mostly seems to be loved by beetles and, and ants. It's really tiny little flowers, but that's a sweet little perennial. And then a viburnum. I think this might be a brandy wine. This is a nativar so it's it is a cultivar but um of a native shrub and i do see some clear wing uh, sphinx moths back here which 
I believe the viburnum is a host plant for them. So I used to think that they were coming for the butterfly bush because that's where they would be eating. But I actually think that they probably were drawn by this viburnum to this garden. So I want to do more of that. I want to get more um, of those kinds of relationships going. Hmm, what is that? What is that? I don't know what that is. I already have a few of the plants that are going in this garden, but I actually bought them in the fall 2021, so a year and a half ago. I never got them planted, and I've been storing them in our raised beds that whole time. So today I'm focused on getting these yellow baptisia dug up and transplanted into the shed garden. To make room for them, I'll be digging out the lavender and bluebeard. And popping those out was relatively easy. They appear to have pretty shallow roots, but wait till you see the roots on the baptisia I'm transplanting. To design a new color palette, I learned this trick a few years back. Look at what color combinations artists use. They sometimes come up with really unusual combinations that the rest of us might not naturally pick. So I'm looking at some abstract art to see if I can find a spunky warm color scheme that I'll actually like and that will make this flocks pink that isn't my favorite look really awesome. And yes, I do see the irony of my shirt choice for this video. Ooh, here's an interesting one with a lot of complex warm colors in it. Let's try to build a palette. First, I'll pull this yellow, which works with our Baptisia. I'll throw in some white to help give some rest for the eyes. There's this beautiful deep purple magenta. Orange, which is the complementary color to purple. Our Phlox pink is in there. And interestingly, red. I would not think to put red with this pink or purple, but I think it really works. Okay, so there's our palette. And now we need to find plants that match it. I've ordered plants from Prairie Moon Nursery in the past and the price was great and the plants were beautiful and really thrived. So I'm ordering with them again. One nice thing is that you can filter their plants based on color, which is perfect for this project. I went through each color in the palette and picked at least one plant for each. Here's what I came up with. For yellow, of course, we have our yellow Baptisia, which is a host plant for the wild indigo dusky wing skipper and the clouded sulfur butterfly. And I also picked a native sunflower that will feed the bees and birds will also eat the seeds in the fall. And it's a host for the silvery checker spot. For white, I picked hairy wood mint, which is pollinated by long tongue bees, and culver's root, which attracts butterflies and numerous different solitary bees like sweat bees and bumblebees. For the purple, I ordered purple milkweed, which is gorgeous and of course is great for the monarch butterflies. I also ordered tall ironweed, which is a great late season nectar source. And then it also is a host plant for the parthenus tiger moth. And finally, I ordered some tall larkspur, which is a favorite for hummingbirds and bumblebees. For orange, I've got butterfly milkweed, which is a great little plant and a bee magnet. For pink, we'll have pale purple coneflower, great nectar source for hummingbirds and butterflies, and a host for the auto skipper. Our phlox, which attracts swallowtails and hosts the phlox moth, which is considered to be critically imperiled. And wild petunia, which is great because it blooms throughout the hottest and driest times in the summer. And it's also a host plant for the common buckeye butterfly. And finally, for red, I ordered royal catchfly. This one attracts hummingbirds and black swallowtails. But the host plants don't stop at this garden. Nearby we have lots of oak trees and black cherries which host hundreds and hundreds of butterfly caterpillars. And the phlox this garden centers around attracts swallowtails. And nearby we have tulip poplar and sassafras which are hosts for swallowtails. So our trees will be helping to support the bugs that visit this little shed garden. Also, I forgot to mention, there's a storm coming, so I'm racing the clock. Since there's a storm coming, I'm just doing the bare minimum today to get these Baptisia transplants in. Digging these up just as they're about to bloom is not ideal, but I'll show you what they look like about a week later. I'm putting my money on the Baptisia. Okay. Trauma. I'm so sorry, plant. Yeah. And check out the roots on these things. I They can go as deep as seven feet underground. Come on, girl. Come on. Let go. Let go so we can get you on the ground. Come on. So many roots. Yep. So many roots. This is going on too long, girl. Let go. Let go. Let go. Let go. You can see why these plants are so hardy and drought tolerant. Like I said, if there's a drought, they won't even know about it.
and I'm actually feeling pretty confident that they're even still going to bloom this spring. We'll have to wait until May to see. Here's the Baptisia, looking like nothing happened. It's kind of a miracle. Baptisia number two, looking a little tired. Hopefully she can perk up. Hopefully these can bloom. Everybody looking a little tired over on this side. Not only are they okay, they're all getting ready to bloom. I ordered all of the new plants for this garden last fall, and a few of them were available as bare root plants, which actually came about a month ago. I've been storing them in the fridge, and now I'll get them started in the raised beds where I had the Baptisia before. And the rest of the plants will be coming in May or June. So be sure to subscribe if you want to see how this little garden turns out. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Old Pollinator Garden. <laughs>